businesses love your work. On this show, we help you make it as a creative entrepreneur, find your unique voice, find the right mindset to succeed, and be the first to capitalize on new opportunities to make a living making your art. I'm David Cadavy. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, please hit subscribe on your podcast app. And to get your free creative productivity toolkit, sign up at cadavy.net slash tools. As soon as you start trying to think about how to stay secure online, you start to feel overwhelmed, don't you? It's hard to think up new passwords that are tough to hack, and it's even harder to keep them all straight. The two-factor authentication that more and more services are starting to require is just annoying sometimes. Chris Wilkin is founder and CEO of Let's Fix Security. He takes a behavioral approach to thinking about security, trying to make good security practices easy to implement. As a small business owner and a person in general, I have been thinking more and more about how to stay secure online. I have limited resources as a solopreneur. Any unexpected interruption or loss of data means I'm not working on the things I want to be working on, yet I also don't have the resources to have a full-time security expert to keep things buttoned up. It's probably the same for you, so this episode is for you. In this episode, we'll talk about, are you a target? You don't have to be high profile to be a victim of a security breach. Find out why everyone is vulnerable. How can good habits make security easy? We often put off thinking about digital security because it can be overwhelming. Throughout this whole conversation, we'll be talking about how to reduce overwhelm so you can take action. And learn what the four buckets of security are. We'll be talking about how to prioritize your security concerns again so you can take action make sure your most important stuff is secure. One thing I want to mention, I talk in this conversation about canisters for securing cryptocurrency paper wallets. I researched them further. It turns out that's not what they're called. So if you search, you'll have trouble finding them. They're actually intended to be pill cases. So you would want to search for pill cases if you're looking for them. They are still very, very handy for keeping paper-based two-factor authentication numbers, especially if you're nomadic or traveling. We're going to talk about that more in the interview. I have linked to some in the show notes. And thank you so much to our newest Patreon backers, Doug Coe and Gail Dalton Hernblad. Gail says, I like your podcast and I like the idea of buying you a cup of coffee once a month. So thank you so much, Gail and Doug and all of you Patreon supporters. We are really gaining traction with the show after three years and it is very much thanks to you. So if you would like to support Love Your Work on Patreon, contribute a coffee a month or more or less, go to patreon.com slash cadavy. That is patreon.com slash cadavy. And are you going to start something new in 2019? Are you trying to find the inspirational and motivational fuel to make that thing happen? Here is a quick tip from my book, The Heart to Start. We tend to dream beyond our abilities, and that's good. It keeps us motivated. But at the same time, it intimidates us. In The Heart to Start, I call this the fortress fallacy. It's like you're dreaming of building a giant fortress, but you're not ready for that yet. You're just getting started. The best way to overcome the fortress fallacy is to scale back your vision. Instead of building that fortress, start with a cottage. Keep that fortress in your mind's eye, keep building your skills, and soon building that fortress won't be so intimidating. If you haven't read The Heart to Start, the book Seth Godin calls Solid Advice from David Cadavy, that's me, The new year is the perfect time to read this book. Search for The Heart to Start on Amazon, Audible, or wherever books and audiobooks are sold. Here's Chris Wilkin. Okay, so I'm here with with Chris Wilkin. And so, Chris, what do you usually tell people? Like, what, what do you do? I'm glad you asked. So I help people and companies fix their security. And my, my company is actually called Let's Fix Security. Oh, okay. And I call it Let's Fix Security because it's not something that I can do only by myself. It's something that we do together. Uh, okay. So that's something that we can hopefully do together today because I, I think that this episode will, will, will have it come out a little bit uh, right around the new year. And I, I think people often associate New Year's with uh, let's get fit, let's uh, 
let's well last year we had a habits episode at the beginning of the year i mean i i often think about getting my finances in order i think it's good for, it's a good time to rethink these these big sort of systemic things in one's life and i think digital security mm-hmm. you're staying secure in your digital life is one of those things that you just you it takes a lot of energy to 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 do it and you never really get around to it until you have some sort of an epiphany or opportunity and and the, the new year is maybe a good time to do that I, and and i would even add to that is you probably don't get around to it until something bad happens and then you're like oh shit yes i need to fix this right you don't get around to it until something something bad happens and actually it's it's interesting that um we're sitting in an Airbnb right now, a beautiful Airbnb. This is a so much place. better than the one that I was in a few days ago where I arrived and discovered there were bed bugs in there. Unfortunately, I discovered pretty early, um, you know, cause somebody had told me to be paranoid about that. But now that that has happened to me, every single hotel, every single Airbnb that I ever go to immediately, I'm going to conduct an, ex- an inspection because I've had something bad. Ha- it was 24 hours of of kind of hell. I mean, that, that's an exaggeration, right. but it was bad. It, like I had to cancel a meetup. Like it, 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 it just ruined it. It ruined everything uh, for, for 24 hours. And, and now I think I'm in the clear, which is, which is good. But I think that the same thing happens with, with security is that if something hasn't happened to you, then maybe it's hard to get yourself to think about it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. I actually have this conversation with um, clients and even potential clients is, Oh, I've never, never been hacked. I've never had anything bad happen. I'm too small potatoes, maybe even. Um, the, the hackers out there are more concerned with the big companies like banks or, you know, targets and, and those types of places. And, and, and really it's, it's not that, that case. It's, um, you can get swept up into, um, something else that somebody else has, has done. And now you're a victim. Mm-hmm. So you don't necessarily need to be a specific target of somebody, but you can, you can, you can be, let's call it collateral damage for lack of a better term. Well, and then I, I also think that maybe a misconception is that people imagine that if they're getting hacked, that there's physically somebody sitting on their computer targeting them personally. And that that's obviously, that's not going to happen because I'm too small potatoes, but is that the only way that a person can get hacked? So, so, so this is really interesting because, um, a lot of us use, you know, many services online. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have like an Amazon account and you have some, some other accounts that, you know, maybe you're, you're, you know, not as high profile as Amazon. You know, maybe, maybe you have, um, say an account on, say, like a message board that you're very active on or something like that. And all of these little sites that you use, have the potential of getting hacked. Mm-hmm. And some of those could be targeted getting hacked. Some of it could just be um, a, a, a hacker or a group of hackers wrote a script to exploit vulnerabilities and they just send it out over the internet. And that site that you're using just happened to be one of those that was not keeping up with security patches on the website, got the site hacked, got all of the user, you know, usernames and passwords uh, dumped and then started to get cracked. And now those usernames and passwords that used on that site might be tried on other sites like, like an Amazon or, you know, PayPal or anything like that. And, and, and that, that's something that many people don't think about because most people are thinking about them personally getting hacked, not the services that I use getting hacked. Right. And um, so is that one of those cases where if you're using the same password on one of those sites as another, then you've got a problem? Yes. That, that is, that is exactly it is, okay. um, if you happen to be using the same password, say, you know, that you're using on a message board and you use it on Amazon, um, the first things that, you know, once, once a username and password is compromised, it's going to be tried out. On all sorts of sites, whether it's um, you know the, the the big Amazons of the world, the you know targets, um, all, all sorts of sites, um, Google, for instance, even to see what else can can happen. And and the 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 thing that many people don't think about 
is all of those things are happening automatically. So it's not that somebody has a username and password and going through a list and typing in a username and password. All of that's being harvested and then automatically put in a script and just trying out. And then if something hits, then it's flagged and somebody else then goes right. in and starts looking at things. So it, yeah, it's a script. It, it is not one person specifically sitting down and hacking you. Right. It's just, it's automatic. It's happening all the time. These, these attempts are happening all the time. So, I mean, we've, we've kind of gone through one scenario is that you could have a service that you were using, uh, get hacked and it has your email and password. And then that gets used on some other service. What are some other, uh, things that we're protecting against uh, the, the typical individual or perhaps solopreneur? Yeah. So, so I like to think of this. And, and bucket this into categories of things. And, yeah. and I, I like to call it maybe say categories of importance. So the, the first category, it's, it's the biggest is your email. Where's your email being, being stored on? What are you using and how are you protecting that? Um, you know, a, a lot of people use Google or Gmail or, or even like G Suite for, their email, which is great. Um, a lot of other people actually use email hosted by, you know, a, a website hosting provider, which is not necessarily as great as Google. There's, there's some, some nuances that maybe we can talk about when it comes to privacy. But the, the overarching thing is that Google is doing a lot of things to protect email, which maybe some hosting sites don't have the, the scale or the, the tech expertise or engineers that are doing the same things as Google. So that's something to kind of think about is where's your email stored? How are you properly protecting that email? What are you using that email address for as well? Because if your email gets compromised, your Amazon could get compromised, everything else, because you can just start doing a password reset on all of these services, goes to your email, and now other accounts of yours start to get compromised. So I like to put email as kind of like the number one category. Yeah, because email is, uh, I don't know what the term would be. It's Everything like a, is tied to email. It's to to everything else and, and that, you know, somebody could password reset things. And that, that's where the confirmation. Email yeah. Comes. Yeah. Here's the, here's your code to confirm that this is really you. It's going to go to your email. Yeah. Or, or even. You know, I, I, I know a lot of sites that like a, a, a ticket master type site where you go, you forgot your password. It sends you to your email a link that you click on and then go back to the site and just put in a new password. Right. And many sites are set up like that, which, you know, we, we can have other conversations if that's the best way, but it is, it is what it is right now. And, Many of us can't change how a company is deciding how to do a password mm -hmm. reset with email. So email is one bucket. Email is one bucket. And that's, that's, that's like your most important, most important one for most people. For, mo <laughs> for most people, I, I think everyone probably listening to this is, is using email. So uh, I would, I would, <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would put that towards the top. Um, the, the second bucket would be something like your financial accounts. So the banks that you're using. You know, if, if you're using PayPal or, um, you know, Venmo or any of those types of companies that are actually dealing with money, um, that would be a second category. If you are, um, say accepting credit cards through your business or something like that, maybe you have, you know, PayPal, for instance, maybe you have something like Stripe, maybe you have, um, other type of payment processors that, that would fall into that category as well because um, if you are not diligent about those types of things, you could potentially lose money. And that, that becomes very problematic as well. Hmm. And so can you walk us through one of those potential scenarios? Cause we've, we've got an idea of kind of some, at least one of the risks with email. What, when you say lose money with, with the financial stuff, um, how, how might that work? So, so let's say, um, you, you, get your bank account compromised. Um, people could transfer money out, out of that bank account. And if mm -hmm. you aren't diligent about looking at the transactions on your bank account statement, um, and, and I will say this, different countries have different rules around um, financial transactions and being able to 
reverse fraudulent transactions. Yeah. Um, in the United States, they're, they're, they're pretty good. I've had credit card fraud four times in the last, I had credit card fraud four times in one year, just like the last year. Um, and which, which is, which is not. Still, four times is like that's, that's a lot. That's, that's a lot. And we can talk about how I'm preventing that too, or or how to prevent that. But yeah, it was a lot. And then a couple times it was in physical space, you know, traveling, living in in uh, foreign, South America, foreign countries. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, because the it, infrastructure there is different from from a technical standpoint. The infrastructure there is a little different than what we oh. have in the United States. Yeah. So. Um, and, and I, I don't well, know about the is, specifics. These, these situations were an employee. Two of them were definitely like an employee interacting or I'm one was for sure an employee interacting with a, with a card. A second one most likely was. And then the other two, um, were just kind of out of the blue, probably, um, technology related, probably. But you never you know, know, right? You don't, you don't always know. And that's, that's the other thing of why it's important to, to protect those things. One, one thing I, I do want to mention is you're talking about credit card fraud. Yeah. That's um, kind of even out of the scope of what we're talking well, about. Well, that's digital that's, life. Right? That's one category of things with a bank. Um, when you're talking about actual your bank account, your checking account or a savings account, there's different rules around being able to reverse fraudulent transactions on that. If you're talking yes. about a debit debit card, even though it is used similar to a credit card and you can charge similar to a credit card, there are different rules around that as well, yeah. which um, that's also very interesting. And not many people are, are actually very familiar with those, those nuances where the credit card, um, I, I, you know, when I, when I buy things online, I, I always use a credit card, never use a debit card. And I've had conversations with some of my clients around don't use debit cards online because your, your ability to reverse a fraudulent charge with debit card is different than with a credit card. And very few people know those nuances. And, right. and, and, and that's specifically dealing with, with the U.S. Um, there's, you know, different banks may do different things as well. So I, I, I don't want to necessarily say that, but at least the rules around the FTC rules around credit cards and debit cards are, are definitely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, one thing that, uh, that just to quickly get out one solution or, or one thing that I'm doing now is that, you know, something like Amazon, I trust Amazon generally and, and PayPal. So if I, if I can do use Amazon pay or, or PayPal to pay for something, I, I try to go ahead and do that. If I do get into a situation where, for example, I bought tickets to Machu Picchu and the Peruvian government's website for selling these tickets that you have to buy is I've not been on a sketchier website since my first online purchase in like 1997. <laughs> it's in flash and uh, you have to, you have to pay with a credit card. Um, now they, they do tell you that they, that you need to have the card on you when you, when you were arrived. Fortunately, they didn't uh, in, just to, to avoid fraud. Right. Okay. They show that you bought this ticket. Uh, which fortune, which they didn't, um, which they didn't end up verifying. Uh, so I think I bought it a different way, but the way I would have liked to have done it was with a service called privacy.com. Um, which is basically you can create a, a throwaway credit card number that takes the money out of your bank account and works with that, um, with, whatever site and you can limit it. You can say, okay, well, this is just for Spotify. Um, they can charge $10 a month to this. You can limit the number, you know, how much they charge. And, uh, yeah, it's a really amazing service. And you wow. can even have an app where you can show the virtual card, um, to somebody in your, in your, in your wallet. And it's just one off credit card numbers, privacy.com. It's amazing. Yeah, and I see I, your I, face lighting up because I'm surprised it sounds like you haven't heard of it. I haven't heard of this. I'm, I'm curious about it. Um, I, I'm conceptually, the idea sounds good. It's always comes down to the technical execution underneath of that sure. on like what, what's going on. Um, but I, but I'm, I'm interested enough. I want to look into it because I, I know that there's been a lot of things, especially with credit cards where, 
you know, some banks may have it where you can have a different credit card every online purchase, but then that somehow goes back to your, your credit card that, that you actually have. And that's to limit fraud. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious what they're doing around it. I'm also curious about like how they're, you know, doing the transaction with your bank account and things like that. Yeah. They have yeah. your bank account. Yeah. Which I get nervous about on that piece mm-hmm. is like whenever, whenever a, a, company online has your bank account that's not um your bank i get very nervous about it because somebody could potentially withdraw money mm-hmm. um there, there there are some nuances around that but like that that's the piece that i get very nervous yeah about. and maybe we can i think we'll talk about that abstractly as we talk about um things like risk tolerance and and you know Tra- now you're getting off. into the security jargon. Well, of- <laughs> not, not just not just yet. But so anyway, we've got these these buckets. So there's email, financial, financial. The the other the other the, the third bucket that I like to talk about is is anything critical for you, yeah. and and this varies depending who it is. So for for some people, um, their Instagram account may be very important for them because maybe they're using Instagram to. Um, earn money. Maybe they're using Instagram to, you know, bring in leads to their business. That, that is one category of things. Um, maybe, maybe people have a website and that's what they're using to market themselves or maybe even con- conduct transactions. Um, there's some criticality around that, that those being, being able to log in, protecting the, 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 uh, login information that, that people are using, that becomes very critical as well. So when, when I, when I say a critical bucket, it's really, you have to think about it yourself. What are the things that are very important for you that you wouldn't necessarily want hacked or right. you, you don't want that login compromised or, um, or, or any access to that site? Yeah. I mean, for me, somebody with a, a number of different websites that I host, it, it might be like my hosting platform. Or something. Right. Exactly. Your, your hosting provider, your, um, if your hosting provider might be different than your, um, DNS provider. Yeah. That actually is super critical because if somebody has access to your DNS, they can take, say, for instance, um, your website, point it to a different web server. Oh, okay. And, very few people will be the wiser. And I do have a different DNS provider. I actually, the name escapes me right now. So, <laughs> so, so that's that right. But, but that's, that's something that's very important to think about is especially like when you're thinking of web infrastructure and if you're a, uh, uh, you know, entrepreneur or solo entrepreneur, um, all of those individual pieces that make up your website are very important. So all of your domain names that you have. Especially if maybe you have multiple services where you've registered domain names. So, mm-hmm. so we, we have a, we have a mutual friend who has a lot of domain names and he has some on, I think, Namecheap and something else and like another one. And just keeping track of all of those things and the logins of that starts to create some complexity. Um, just in managing domain names. Yeah. And so email, financial, critical. Yes. And, and then, and, and then the, the fourth category is everything else. Okay. Um, and, and, and this is, this is the ones where, you know, maybe it's okay if the accounts do get compromised. So, um, uh, an, an example of that is like maybe, maybe somebody has a Twitter account and they're not posting Twitter, uh, or posting to Twitter about, you know, the, their latest podcast episode or something that they're doing. Maybe they're just using their Twitter account to consume information of, you know, what other people are posting. Mm-hmm. Maybe Twitter for them isn't that critical. So it, it could be something that, you know what, if their Twitter account gets compromised, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Right. And I think an important element of this is, and this is why it becomes one of these good items to to look at as the year changes, because a lot like, say, working out or changing your diet, it can become overwhelming. You, it's the cognitive burden of looking at this. You just realize there's so much to think about. There's so many potential things that you could do wrong. There's so many potential things that could go wrong. Um, and, and, and we'll just 
forget it. I'm not right. gonna, what, what do right. people say usually? They're like, oh, oh, it's, uh, uh, so, so people that I talk with, the, yeah. the, the first response is, um, almost say overwhelm and then not wanting to do something about it. Yes. And so my typical approach is to start, I, I don't know if you've read the, the, the book. Um, what is it? Eat, eat that frog by Brian Tracy. I think it is or something like that, but it, but it's That's what it's called. Yeah. It is. It is. It. Yeah. Okay. It, but, but it's basically do it one step at a time. So maybe not try to tackle all of these buckets all at once, but maybe you just focus on email and you're going to protect email. And so when you, you know, protect your email, you're going to make sure that your password for that email account is a long password. Um, there, there's, there's some nuances about password and password, um, complexity that's come out over the last couple of years where basically the, the, the biggest thing with passwords is to have a long password. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the second thing to that is maybe if your email provider allows it is to add in uh, two factor authentication or use an authenticator app or use, um, like a UB key to further protect that. I know different email providers have different things set up. So it's going to be very specific to, to yeah. what you're using with email, or you could always move your email to something like a Gmail or something like, um, office 365, which hosts email and they do a very good job at that. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, let's, let's go over that email component a little bit. Um, do you know how long of a password they allow on, on Google, on Gmail, or I have, uh, uh, you know, I, I, you can have up to 64 with the password manager that I use and we can talk about password management yeah. a bit. Okay. But, um, I don't know if they I, allow a 128 or something longer. I, I don't know on Gmail. Um, I do know, and, and this, this was a, a, a point of issue with, with me was, um, Office 365 shortened their password requirement. Hmm. So they used to allow a longer password and then something changed with what they were doing. And now there, um, there was a limit to the amount of characters that you could use. And that was very frustrating for me because I made it a point that I wanted to have a very long password. Yes. Um, I've, I've had to change that. They, they recently released something that I need to look into a little bit more where you can use uh, a UB key to access your email. And that's, that will, will, let's call it mitigate that risk for me. Right, right. So I'm trying to think about how to, guide us through this in a way that is going to reduce the overwhelm a little bit um, and and give people a, a chance to know that, all right, here's things maybe you should do. And then also, uh, also maybe there's some things that you, you, you're willing to take the risk, like you said, that maybe something happens with this account and, well, at least your life was easier because you didn't have to do two-factor authentication on this Twitter account that you don't use or something like that. Right. Um, so how do you come up with this long password that in a way that you can remember it? So, so I actually use a password manager. Sure. Um, I, I use, uh, one password. I, I, I like how that is, um, is set up. There's, there's nuances about a lot of the different password managers. And if you're in the security community, um, there are certain ones that people like more than others, just based on how those password managers were were set up and and architected. Um, but I would say this, just overall for anyone out there, using a password manager is much better than not using a password mm-hmm. manager. Using a password manager is much better than using the same password for every single account, um, or using say categories of passwords for categories of your accounts. So like I, I know some people have used if if say anything financial related, I'm going to use the same same password for everything financial related. Um that that was a good practice, say, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, something like that. Nowadays, with all of the websites getting hacked and all of the passwords getting exposed online, um just, just so everyone knows, when whenever a site is hacked, um, those those if if the usernames and passwords are able to get compromised, 
those get dumped on the internet in all sorts of various places. Sometimes they get sold, sometimes they're just posted online, anything like that. And there are people who start compiling these lists of passwords together and usernames and password combinations. Um, there's a site I really like. It's called um, You've Been Pwned or or mm-hmm. or Have I I think I think it's Have I Been, have I been Pwned or some P-W-N-E-D. something like that. Yeah. Yes. Um, that site compiles all of these username and password combinations um, from any hack that it finds out about or anything that it's able to get access to. And and you start to see patterns in how people create passwords around things. And so you now know the most frequently used passwords. So if if you have an account and you use a password where, you know, sometimes people are clever where um, you know, it's it's winter time now and it's winter of 2018. And so to, to create a strong password that they can remember, they do, you know, winter with a capital W 2018. Mm-hmm. And that will meet, you know, and, and maybe like, you know, a special character at the well, end. In or a way, they're, like they're, they're following all of the advice. It's like following oh, all change, of the advice. Change your password every three months. Yes. Well, it's winter now. I got to come with a password. Yes. And so, like, and then also, well, change the case. And you know, maybe have a number in there. So you you've turned uh you you've turned like the I in winter to a one or something. Yep. But but hackers are um are 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 on on this, right? Well, so, well like, so the crazy thing is, is that you may think it's clever for yourself, but so does the person next to you, so does you know somebody else, because you know, and, and it fits the model of password complexity too. And so, you know, people need to remember these things. So you start to see kind of like patterns in the behavior when you're looking at all of these things happen on the aggregate. And so you start seeing these things where, yes, that is a very common pattern that people come up with Mm -hmm. in order to remember a password. And so now, instead of that being, you know, I don't know, number, you know, 100,000 on the list of passwords to try, now it's like number two on the list. And so... Instantly, when you know somebody's trying to send through usernames and passwords, that's one of the common. That's one of the first combinations to try. Yeah, and and, and so even though the length of the password might be such that if if someone were to try every single possible combination with that length of password using whatever technology they use to crack passwords, that might actually take a long time. But because of human behavior and the way that and the the passwords that we tend to settle on. And the fact that there are models and scripts out there made to follow those patterns, I'm imagining. Um, and you're, you're shaking your head yes. Yes. That, uh, uh, that it actually takes far less time it, to it, crack such it, a password. It, it, it does. That's, that's exactly. So, so, um, I, I used to do back, back in the day and, and I some, somewhat do this today, but, um, I used to do a lot of, um, what, what's called, uh, hacking attempts for clients of mine where I would go in like I was a hacker and try and you know break into the company and say, Hey, here's all where the weaknesses are and here's how you fix those things. And one of the things that we had, um, when we were able to get a list of usernames and passwords was what was called the dictionary list. And it's basically every single word in the dictionary, you know, in alphabetical order going all the way down from A to Z. And you set that up that word list against the password hashes, which is normally how passwords are stored. And it just goes through the list and tries to find a match. Um, Very inefficient when you're trying to crack passwords very quickly. And so where that changed was you started to find out what the more frequently used passwords were. And that moved to the top of the list because the, the, the cracking script that you would use went, you know, first on the list and then moved to the second, moved to the third. And so now you start to become more efficient with that process because now you know what more frequently used passwords are. Mm-hmm. So, so that, 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 that was, that was interesting. And that's how you start to see these patterns where, um, a lot of people when they're thinking of passwords end up kind of all coming together with the same thought process to come up with a complex password that fits the rules that you need, but also something that they can remember. So then how do you come up with an actual complex password that's not so easy to... (laughs) 
<laughs> so, so I actually use, um, one password has this. I don't know if, um, you know, Dashlane or LastPass or anything else has this, but there's an actual password generator in one password and you can have it set up where it can use just a randomly generated number of characters. And that would be uppercase, lowercase, um, numbers, special characters, things like that. Or you can also have it. And, and this is, this is where the new thought process around passwords is where you can have two, three, four, five, six, whatever you want words together. And that creates a sufficiently long enough password that at least mathematically it becomes very hard to crack. And those word, those words used together are random enough that it becomes very hard for a password list to actually have. Right. And so then you can have a pretty long password that perhaps you might even be able to remember. You might places. even be able to remember it. Right. I've, I've found that, um, if you use the password frequently, you start to remember it, but that, that could just be me. I, I don't yeah. know if that, that works with every, everyone else. And I notice whenever I recommend one password to, to people, the response, you, you know what the response is. Well, but then there's one password and they have access to all your passwords. And interestingly, that I, uh, some people have that reaction and then they just go on doing what they're doing, which is to use the same password yes. on every single site. Yes. So what level of paranoia is it to worry that somebody can crack your, cause your one password, it syncs across all your devices and it usually sync, it might sync through, say, Dropbox, right? So, yes. so say somebody hacks your Dropbox, they get to your one password, uh, file. And then they hack that password as well. Now they have all of your passwords. Yes. What level of paranoia is that to worry that that might happen? So, so one, one of the things with that is this is where all of those things fall into probably that critical category. Mm -hmm. And so it's how am I protecting all of these things together, such as a, a password? Um, I typically don't have those things sync across like, you know, whether it's a Dropbox or like a single source, what I, okay. what I typically have is, and I know one password can do this. I don't know if the other ones can, but you can actually sync it device to device. And that's the way I, I prefer to do it because then it's not going on a Dropbox where, you know, in the past Dropbox has been hacked. Um, it's not going to say iCloud where, you know, in the past iCloud accounts have also gotten hacked or anything like that. Um, doing the device to device sync, I, I tend oh, to find myself. I didn't even know that this was an option. Yes. And, and I don't know if, if all the password managers have an option like that. I know one password does because I've looked into it enough. So what's the technology it's using to, to, it's just Wi-Fi. It it's just a Wi-Fi sync. So it's basically, um, to get, to get nitty gritty technical details. Yeah. Um, it's opening a port on your workstation and you take your, your iPhone or, you know, Android phone or anything like that. It opens a port. It does a connection to it because you put in the password on, on your one device and the other device and it just syncs yeah. up. From there. And this is one of those things where, uh, we were talking about this before we began our conversation about how the way that you manage security for yourself, you need to also manage complexity because if you make things too complex, then you start to put yourself in situations where you make yourself lazy and then you actually make yourself less secure. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those situations where I'm thinking about now because I uh, have often changed a password mm -hmm. and then I go to a different device and I try to use that password that I just set up and, and now and it hasn't synced yet. Yep. Or has it, or, or I, or I can't get it to sync and I get really annoyed and, uh, and, and, and frustrated with it. And it makes you, it, it puts you at risk of deciding, well, just forget it. I'm just not going to do right. this anymore. I'll do it later. So I'm wondering about this, this syncing. I'm trying to think of the situations with the syncing thing where, okay, would there be situations where you don't have a chance to sync? But I guess, yeah, I don't know. If you're, if you have the phone and you have the computer and they're on the same Wi Fi network and they sync that way, then maybe it doesn't happen that often. You can, you can, you can set it up if, if I remember correctly. And it's, it's been a while since I've actually set it up and kind of paid attention to these things, but you can set it up where it automatically syncs at a certain time. Um, 
I do a couple of other things where I lock down the ports but of my on, workstation and things like that. But if for like some that, reason your computer and your phone are in different locations, that becomes harder. Yeah, that becomes harder. But then again, if you're in different, if they're in different locations and you're not using them, you're only using one. You're only in one location. Then maybe it's a moot point. It it it, it could be the. I I think that the challenge with something like that starts to become if you're traveling and you leave your workstation you know, in one location, you travel with your phone or something like that, and you need to access something. That's where that that starts to, to, to definitely get a little complicated. Yeah, okay. So um, using a password manager such as such as one password, then if so then if you're syncing your passwords, and you're not, it's not in Dropbox. Um, all right, so then, then how does somebody hack your one password? So they would need to compromise the device itself. So that means you either a lose your phone mm-hmm. and you don't have a password set on your phone or your phone. And I, I know a lot of phones now um, come with encryption on the phone by, by default. So if you set a password, for instance, on an iPhone, um, the, the, uh, the data is encrypted. Data, right. Stored on the phone is encrypted. Yeah. Right. Um, but I, I know that that's not always the case. It, it depends on the specific devices that you use. So one of the, 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 the things that I do is, you know, look at that device and make that decision based on, I, I know a lot of people say buy a phone based on, you know, camera or, or, you know, screen size or something like that. I'm looking at something like, you know, what type of capabilities does it have? What, what does the uh, encryption look like? What does the, you know, is it using, say facial recognition or, you know, thumbprint recognition, or do I need to just input a, a, you know, number digit code of a certain length or a short length or whatever that looks like. Like that's, that's how I, I'm thinking of those mm-hmm. things. Well, and, and we all just recently saw uh, Kanye West at uh, <laughs> talking to the, the president and, and he pulls out his iPhone and just taps one, 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 one. And, you know, now we all know Kanye's, uh, right. Right. Code for, for but you have phone. to get to Kanye's phone. You have to get to his phone. You have first. to get to his phone. Right. Right. So, so maybe, and, and, and I know we were talking about this earlier. Maybe Kanye's threat model is, is, is much lower. Threat model, by threat the way. Threat model, right? Which is a jargon term. Security you know, jargon just, term. So, so maybe Kanye isn't worried about somebody accessing his phone because he probably has an entourage mm-hmm. and he probably has bodyguards who are with him all the time. And so him losing his phone or him getting his phone stolen, not something that he needs to worry about. So, so he can have a password. So why have a passcode at all? (laughs) That's, that's a great question too. Right. Well, and I've, I've talked to somebody about the passcode as well, because I think we all have a tendency. We want, it's annoying. Yes. Um, you know, to, to, if, if you have it so that every single time you unlock your phone, you've got to use that passcode. Then you get in this issue again where like you've made it complex and by making it complex, you have made yourself lazier and that by doing that, you've made yourself less secure. Um, and so where is the happy medium there? I remember talking to somebody who had perfectly reasoned it out that, you know, the, the longest amount of time, I think, I don't know if it's hours or whatever, that his, his phone wouldn't lock until that amount of time. And, uh, and, I, I was like, well, wait, wait, does that, does that work? I mean, like, cause if somebody steals your phone, et cetera, right. what if like, you, well, you have forget? to sleep again, you have to, you have to sleep eventually. So the phone's going to lock at some point was, was his reasoning. I don't, I don't remember it perfectly, but, but I, I guess for yourself, like, how do you manage that? Um, how do you balance the annoyance of having to unlock your phone every time, uh, with uh, making yourself slightly less secure by having it lock after a longer amount of time? So, so one of the things with me, I have to practice what I preach. Uh huh. So I have my screen lock set for either one minute or two minutes or whatever that, that, that is. Um, and I try to, when I'm done with using my phone to lock it immediately, Mm -hmm. but that's also a habit that I've built up over, you know, the 15 or so years that I've been doing security is just that's, that's automatic for me. I know that that's not automatic for a lot of people. And, and uh, here, here's a funny story. One of the reasons why that's automatic for me is I used to work with a lot of security people and we'd play tricks on each other. Uh-huh. And so if you left your workstation unlocked, they would be sending an email to, 
our, our mutual boss, you know, saying something like something embarrassing about me or, or sending an email saying, you know, um, I'm done. I quit. Um, you know, here's, here's my official <laughs> resignation. And, and everyone knew that that was, that meant that somebody left their computer unlocked. And, and by, by doing just kind of like that collegial activity, we started to get very diligent about keeping our stuff locked mm-hmm. because if you even so turned around to talk to somebody, somebody else would try and sneak in and try and send something out. Um, that, that's, that's a very good, at least practice for security people. Um, I don't know if that's a very good practice for everyone else, but it teaches you those things and it builds in that habit mm-hmm. and behavior so that now it's automatic for me to lock my phone. Right. And the habit or, component is good because what, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about here is managing your cognitive burden of keeping yourself secure. Yes. Is that if, a, if it's a habit, it's automatic. There's pretty much no cognitive burden. Yes. But it sort of starts, as soon as you start piling on that cognitive burden, you start to get lazy with certain things and then your, your, uh, your system falls apart. Exactly. And, and so, you know, when, when you're thinking about security and we're talking about all of these things, maybe the most important thing for somebody to do is, you know, for, I think, what is it? 20, 21 days. Is that like the, the yeah, that habit building I exercise. Don't know that, that's not actually true, but okay, yeah. <laughs> it sounds good though, right? Yeah, it does. Right. There's there's some habits out there that would take 21 days to yeah, build. There's, yeah. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. I I, w- I would say this is maybe like the best thing that somebody could do is just make it a point every time that they set their device down or leave their computer to lock it. And that's this button on the top of the iPhone. That's yeah, right. Like the iPhone has a button on the top, or you know, your laptop. You could just close the screen, and if you've set it so that it requires a password, when you open the screen back up, then um, that's you know that that effectively gets your lock. Yeah, and so mine right now is not locked. It's been sitting here for a while. I, I don't know what I have it set on. I, certain, some 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 amount of time before it locks. Yes. And do you think it should lock instantly when you lock it I, like that? Or? I, I generally try to do one to two minutes mm-hmm. for at, at least for a phone. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's mainly because the, the, the benefit like with the iPhone is you can just, you know, press your thumb and now it's instantly unlocked. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, or, or, you know, if you have face ID, you can like look at it and it unlocks too. Um, not all phones have that, that structure or those capabilities. Um, but it makes it easier now, at least with the thumbprint recognition to lock your phone and then just right. press the button and now it's back unlocked. And that, that makes it easy. And then when we get to the complexity, uh, going further down that complexity line, there's this issue of two factor authentication. And that can be, I find it extremely annoying because I tend to try to not have my phone near me. Um, because it's distracting. Yes. And so then yes. now I've got to do two factor now, now you have to go and get your phone. And, and now I open it up and there's a message on it. And now I forgot what I was even doing. And, and you might have other text messages from other people. And, yeah. and yes. So I'm disincentive, I'm disincentivized to keep two factor authentication <laughs> on, on items. And I, and I find it annoying. Um, so how do we balance that? So, so that's, that's actually a, a really interesting viewpoint. And, um, I, I actually haven't heard that one before. I'm always thinking about behavior. I, I, I know. I, like, how I, can I behaviorally make this thing that I want to have happen? happen? I, I love it because most people are talking to me about two factor authentication where they're like, I just don't want to be bothered with two factor authentication. It's another thing to, to do, not from the productivity standpoint of I'm going to get distracted by having to like stop what I'm doing, pick up my phone, and there's going to be something on my phone that distracts me from what I'm normally doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one way that, that you could do, and, and it's something to think about that there's, there's recently, um, and, and I, this has been going on for a while. There's hardware tokens that you can use. Not all sites and services use the hardware tokens, but you can use a hardware token to get access to hardware like your Gmail. Hardware token. Yes. 
Oh, it's security it jargon. Like yeah, security jargon. So, so it's a, it's a, it's basically a USB key that you plug into your computer, and you have to, you have to do some work to set it up. So, like with with Gmail, you can actually set it up where when you access your Gmail, you put in the key, and that gets you access to it, and you're not actually having to, um, you know, put in a password or anything like that because it's already been set up with the key on the hardware device to um that Google knows that 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 key is associated with your account and it's cryptographically secure that say the key that I use would not be able to get access to your Gmail account. Right. So that that could be one way. Now, not all sites use it, but you could be using that for maybe say your critical sites. That yeah. that could be one way. And another way could be um I don't know if you have an old phone or something like that, but maybe having an old device that just has um, like an authenticator app or oh. something like that on it, where that just, you know, is always with you. Maybe an iPod touch. An iPod touch. Yeah. If, if you have something like that, you can install the authenticator app on it um, and, and carry that with you. Now you don't get the, you know, encryption and things like that, but there are other things that, yeah. that let's, let's say that, that, don't make it as as critical. To protect you from the distraction element. It can do, protect you from I, the I distraction. I do make it a point to, like my iPad doesn't have messaging on it. You know, I make it a point to have some you, you could, device you could, that's Right, you could, you could actually have your authenticator app on your iPad. Mm, yeah, but sometimes in a cafe, I don't have the iPad. I make it a point to not bring the phone. In. Yeah, right, right. And, and, and here's another element is I live in South America, you know, most likely, as careful as I am, most likely eventually my phone is going to get stolen. Yes. Yes. And that... What happens then? Oh, man. So this is, this is where complexity actually and, causes and, and, some and problems. And I, I want to add to that also that I've been in a situation where somebody wanted to steal my phone, probably, and they had a weapon and something went off in, in me and I resisted this person and I, and I got away, thank goodness. But I, I, the, the, I, I think of it as like the more valuable I make this phone, the more likely I'm going to react in this like bad unsafe way, manner. In this unsafe manner, in those situ- and people are like, well, "That's stupid. Why would you do that?" Like because when you're in that situation, you you don't have control over. How right, you're right. React, you're you're just looking to like, and your body just reacts in fight or flight. Yeah. Your body reacts in a certain way. My body reacted in the way it probably shouldn't have, um, but I got away with my phone. But any, but anyway, but like if this phone then suddenly becomes, you know, that important, then then that puts me at this other risk. Yes, it does. Um, this is this so. Is, is it not easy when if you lose your phone to to fix this two factor authentication issue? Um, it it depends, and I hate giving that it depends answer. Um, for certain things, yes, and certain things, no. So, like, if you're using an authenticator app, um, not all authenticator apps allow you to do a backup of those um, of the accounts that you have in an authenticator app. So that creates an additional layer of complexity where you either a have to make sure that there's some type of recovery mode with the website. Um, so, so here here would be an example. I have a hosting provider and that requires me to use my authenticator app for two factor authentication. The, if I lose my phone, I wouldn't be able to get into the account, but I believe I could call them and I believe I could provide them with a lot of information and end up getting that fixed. Um, the, the other side to that, that I worry about is could somebody else, if they knew all of that information, impersonate me and in calling in, Oh, um, the but that that's at least um a targeted attack that would be a targeted attack and exactly. so that is you know the chances of it depending upon your your threat model <laughs> risk profile risk profile threat model i'm not sure how they're different um, we, we were we were talking about all these security jargon terminologies yeah. and all of them yeah th- just based, like, th- th- because th- we're all, we all we all should really um take a take a take five minutes someday and think about the bad things that could go wrong. You know, the negative visualization of like, what are things that, and, and 
what you think is likely might not be what actually happens. Right. Um, but at least having some idea of your quote unquote threat model or like right. what you, what you fear. Right. Having, having at least, I, I like to call it more so scenario planning. Scenario plan. Yes. So and I've been doing a lot of scenario planning with the issues I've had with my visa of like, yeah, really that's, what's going to happen. And right. you sit down, you make a bullet point list. Scenario A, this happens. Scenario B, this happens. Scenario right. C, this happens. And you don't, you know, sometimes something else happens. Yeah. But you've at least, got you've, you've at least thought through. through. Yeah. And, and really at the end of the day, what we're talking about is basically a plan. Yeah. And so the plan would be if I have two factor authentication set up for my Gmail account and my phone gets stolen from me, how can I recover any of those things? And, and it's actually a really good exercise to go through and say, how can I recover this information? Maybe with Gmail, you have it set up where you have um, a secondary, like a, a, a friend who has a number that they can send the information to for recovery. I know, I know um, Gmail does this. They also have like a code that you can print out and you can store somewhere like, you know, in a safe I deposit might, box I or something like that. that. But I don't actually know what it is. <laughs> but, but that's, that's exactly it is you can do these things as a recovery mechanism. It's just that you have to be very diligent about it yeah. and know what you're doing. So it, like, it's very helpful that, that we have these buckets too, because if I, if I think about this two factor authentication, what to do about it. now, unfortunately, I have two factor authentication on quite a few things, but if you can focus it on like, all right, well, let's just figure out with email, email, that scenario. right, right. What am, what am focus I doing? On that. And you know, maybe that's Gmail account. Maybe that, maybe you have an iCloud account too, but like probably everyone does because a lot of people use iPhones. Let's focus on those two and figure out, okay, one, how do I, Make sure I have a strong password. How am I setting up, uh, you know, some type of two-factor authentication? I know if you have an iPhone and an iCloud, um, that's a little seamless for people, which is great. Um, but then also, what do I do if if something goes wrong in the middle, like I lose my phone? What do I what do I have set up to recover all of that? Uh -huh. And if you can go through those steps, that will that will protect yourself. So then you now have a plan and now you know where the things are to recover this. So for instance, I know Apple, you can print out a code. You can take that code. Um, maybe you have a safe deposit box at a bank. And if not, maybe, maybe you should, <laughs> um, or, or, or something like that where you can put it. And now there's some steps that you have to go through to, then access the safe deposit box at a bank with all of your, your codes, for instance. Well, I, I think I'll add, because I'm a little nomadic, I think a lot of other people are nomadic, so having the safe deposit box is a, a sub-ideal thing to do. But I, I know that there are um, little canisters for like paper wallets or yep. for, for, for cryptocurrency paper wallets. They're supposedly fireproof or something, and you could... Maybe print out one of those keys, put it in one of those little canisters, and that's something that you carry around with you, or, or maybe you have all your different keys in there. Yeah, perhaps. that 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 could be that could be another way. Um, you could even set it up where you have a very trusted friend. Okay, and your trusted friend has all this information if something bad happens. Um, you know that that's or or you know, a trusted family member or something like that. You know, maybe you don't have a safe deposit box, but somebody else does. And, you know, you, you, you work something out, but that's, that's the way to think and kind of create a plan for yourself so that if something bad happens, you know what to do and you can quickly recover. Right. Okay. So what about the idea of using a different email address for some of your more critical things, such as your, you know, your investment account. Yes. So I, I actually am a big fan of that. And, and the main reason for that is that, um, a lot of people know my email account. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, I've used it on different services. I use it on different, um, uh, you know, whether, whether it's, shopping or anything like that. So I've, I've used it in places that maybe I shouldn't. Um, and 
some of, some of this is also, I probably need to go back and kind of fix some of those things that I've done in the past. Um, but with some, with something like that, um, you're, you, you, you start to, let's say, um, you start to figure out in, in a similar way to, to bucket things, what I want to maybe say, create an email account that nobody's ever going to know. That's very hard to say, trace back to me. And I use it only for my bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And I say consistently monitor that one. Um, because that, that's, that's my recovery into, into my bank accounts. That's, that's, a, that's a really good idea. I'm a big fan of that. Um, I'm also a big fan of having a different email address for every service that you use. Um, it becomes hard to do. And, and especially I know Gmail, you can do like if you do a plus and then something afterwards, it's kind of creating a different email address. Um, so yeah, that would be like people sign up with my email list. They'll say, yeah, you know, like Jim, David plus Jim plus David at gmail.com. And right. that way they know that if, if they get an email from some weird source that has it in there, you've like, sold off your mailing list or, or, right? or it's otherwise been compromised in some way. Yeah. So yes. You can track back. Who, right. Where and it came from. I, I conceptually, I like that. I, I, um, I wonder though if, if, uh, you know, anyone who's getting email addresses and you're looking at it. And so anything, right. Like, you know, Jim plus, right. You just set something up, anything where it's the plus to the at sign, you just strip that out. And now you have like, I, I think that that's very simple to do. What I'd rather have is like a completely separate account. So yeah. like anything that you're doing with, you know, shopping online with say like Best Buy or Target or anything like that, it's, you know, shopping, you know, I don't know, Chris shopping at gmail.com or something like that. Now that creates a whole bunch of complexity yeah, and a whole bunch that, of emails we're to like that manage. Complexity again. Yes. And, um, yeah. So that, you know, maybe with your just main most important accounts, that's you're critical in your financial. That, that's, that's typically what, what I do is I keep, you know, financial and that's all I, I do. And then I have some like random categories of other email addresses, like a shopping email yeah. address and some other things as well that um, reduces the complexity, but it's still fairly complex. And it's, I mean, this is just a way to think about it. It's just the, the complexity of your adversary, right? Your, your hacker or whatever is if you have it, you, you, to, to access accounts, you need an email address and a password. So if you yeah, have the, if you have really the email it. address, then you already have one of those things. Yep. But say your password password sixty four characters, and that's pretty hard to pretty hard to break uh, these days anyway. Yes. But if you even if you have the password and you don't have the email address, and that email address could be you know maybe that's randomly generated by one password or or something like that as well. Then you have Th then, way more complexity. Right. That 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 creates a lot of complexity, but then it also. Um, for, for lack of a better term, it, it creates kind of a, a stopgap or a firewall to, to get access to your other accounts. Yeah. And, um, it, it's, it's definitely a personal preference at that point is how complex do you want to make it, um, versus how, how secure you want to make it. And what, what I've typically found is I, I started down the path of I wanted to create a separate email address for every single service that I was using. And I think I got to like number 50 and I was like, this is ridiculous. And this was a Gmail account for each <laughs> yeah, one? Yeah, right, right. It was ridiculous. So then I started fixing that and say, okay, you know what? I'm going to create categories. And the categories are a little better, but still it, it, it feels to me like it's a little overburdened. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't figured anything out, but that's I'm, I'm also thinking a lot about those. Things. So this is getting a little advanced, but what if you had a catch all address on your domain using Google apps or whatever, and then you could create a new account for every single account and it would all go into that catch all address and it would yes. effectively feel like you were, you had the same email address. Yes. That right. Like, and, and that's, that's one of the good things with like having a paid email account is you can create what's called aliases for. An, an address and it can be any 
alias that you're you obviously want. getting a lot of spam if you have a catch all though. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, right. You're, you're, you're going, but the, the other thing with it though is Gmail, Google, Microsoft, um, they're dealing with, you know, I don't know, trillions of emails a day, whatever that number is. And they have very good, um, spam filters in place. It's not a hundred percent, but it's better than you managing your own spam. If you filter. look in your spam folder, you see that it is quite good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's the other thing to, to kind of think about there as well. How about security questions? Oh, security questions. Oh, I, I struggle with security questions. Conceptually, I think, I think they're a, a good idea execution wise. I think they're, it's executed well, poorly. First, first of all, most of them are bad security questions. What's your favorite movie? Like, yeah, as if right. that's not a thing that changes right, over right. time. I, I, I would say most people, you, you're, you're going to catch a good number of people who put like Star Wars or you and know, that too, right? Right, like, like that doesn't make it entirely like hard to to recover. Now, I will say, just to paint the picture of the security question, though, that the scenario that we're protecting against. Is what is recovering your your login information if you happen to forget a password? Well, and, and so this is a an adversary, right? Oh yes. Yeah. So so an, and somebody else who happened to get your username and password, maybe or just maybe a username who's actively trying to access your account. So this or this is this is this goes to your bank account. Sometimes this you know, this you would call up. Yeah, this would definitely Chase be a whatever. targeted thing dealing with. Probably not an automated process. Yeah. It's probably going to be, you know, somebody who's, who's trying to type in the information. Maybe, maybe it's not it's automated. It's a high profile threat model. <laughs> yes. Like to, somebody to go, specifically targeting you. Most right. people probably don't have to worry about this, but. Well, it, it's, it's something that, you know, let's say your email address and your password get compromised from some other site that you're using and now somebody's trying to use it on your bank account because 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 yes sometimes you will have the username and password and they, they're like well we haven't seen this device before but yes. can you answer this question yes. about what your favorite flavor of ice cream is right exactly and so then somebody's gonna you know guess chocolate vanilla, vanilla right something right. like that um and and maybe they're going to get in maybe they're not going to get in but it's 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 probably worth it for Whoever is trying to get access to something to at least try the the very basics at at the start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I will say I I, I struggle with security questions. The main reason why I struggle with security questions is um, anyone's favorites or anyone's um, personal information about people. We are giving it away on Facebook or Instagram or anything like that. I I, know, I remember um, what was this. I think this was in the early 2000s when Paris Hilton was, um, you know, more higher profile than she is today. She got her email account hacked because one of the recovery questions was, what, what's the name of your dog? And everyone knew the name of her dog because it was on TV. And so they got access to her email and access to all uh -huh. sorts of things like that. Um, again, though, she's a high profile person, um, you know, specifically targeted by somebody or a group of people. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's also something that you do have to be aware of with what you're posting on Facebook or what you're posting on Instagram or anything, you know, social media is you might be inadvertently giving away answers to security questions just from, you know, your, your posts. So what's the solution? <sighs> my, my solution is to like not post a lot of things to, uh, to any of any of those sites. So, well, what but, you, but yes, that's that's not the solution for everyone well, either. So, what do you think about storing the security question in your password manager, such as one password, and then making the answer some garbly? That that thing? that that is actually or, a very good solution. I've even heard because one one I've heard a person present the possible scenario that somebody calls up the bank and they're like, "Oh, I just smashed numbers on the keyboard for that." To actually make that a, you know, a pronounceable, um, you know, maybe a one password pronounceable, uh, password of, you know, words with dashes in between it. And that's your answer. 
So that if they're, you're in a situation where you're talking human to human and they ask you what your answer was to you, you what your best friend's name is, um, that you can say wagon dash clerk dash yeah. uh, mud. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that actually is a, it's, it's a good idea. I like the idea. It's just that you have to make sure that you manage that well. It's, the complexity is high. The, the complexity so starts different. increasing for those uh, things. Or maybe your most important account. Yep. Or accounts. Right. Maybe you take that extra and, measure. And, and you need to be very diligent, though, as well, is to make sure that you're recording that into your password manager and that you're also saving it and not like forgetting to save it because sometimes that happens too. And then you try and log back in and now you're like, I don't know what yes. this is. And then you try information and it's not correct. And that, then you get frustrated. Yes. It's that, that scenario, unfortunately has happened to me, but I've, I've been able to recover it, but it's like, Oh, wait a minute. I never thought about the downside of putting in say so fake you, information. So you, put in the, you put in the garbly answers to security questions. Yes. And then you lost the answers. I, I, did not hit the save button. I like, I don't know if I got distracted with something or whatever it was. Or maybe the software malfunction. It, it, it could be. Right. Mm-hmm. Hopefully I wasn't hacked. Probably not. But um that that those those simple mistakes can cause some some downstream ramifications. So it's 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 a lot of just be very diligent about it and make sure like when you're when you're done with it, don't quickly move on. Double check reopen, you know, that, that, uh, account, make sure that it has the, you know, username, the password, the security questions in there, close it back out and then move on to the next yeah. thing. Yes. Well, I mean, we've talked about, we've covered a lot of this. We haven't covered everything and I, and I hope that we haven't done so in too much complexity. I think it's, I think it's complex. It's still, I'm, I'm even a little overwhelmed thinking about the things that we've, we've talked about, but I hope that we can give our listeners, you know, some way to approach this in, in a way that isn't going to overwhelm them, that they will be able to take action. Um, and I think that we've given them at least a view of kind of the contours of the things that they might be thinking about. So if we were to sum up today what most people might want to do, uh, what would you say I, I would, the right I would, actions to take? Yeah, this is, this is very good. I, I would say the first thing is to like think about security. And I, I think a lot of people just kind of um, don't spend that extra time thinking about security. Um, so that, that's, that's the first. And then the second is to, to define out what your most critical pieces are and make sure that those are protected and you have a thought process of how it's protected and what you're doing to recover. And, and that's actually thought, thought through so that if something bad happens, it's, it, it doesn't adversely impact you. It doesn't waste a bunch of time that, you know, many of us don't have because we're, we're doing so many things. Mm-hmm. And I would add to that that this is something that I've thought about more and more over, over the past months, something that I'm going to continue to think about and, you know, trying to manage the overwhelm of, of thinking about that is a, is a tricky thing. But one of my solutions is really just, you know, carve out five minutes. 15 minutes, an hour, you know, that you have each week and for several weeks, sit down and think about this and don't, and give yourself permission and not come up with a solution right now. Yes. And then eventually make some actions happen. And eventually these habits, uh, get built in so that, so that you can, as you move forward, um, make decisions that keep you secure. Yes. I, I, I really like that a lot is, don't try and do everything all at once because it's, it's going to burn a bunch of cycles and, and it might leave you with more questions than answers. And when you end up having a lot of questions, you're just going to like set it aside and not come back. It's like it. joining the gym and then hiring a trainer and going and doing a three hour workout yeah. and then right. not being able to walk for two weeks <laughs> and then and never going back to the gym afterwards going or going to the gym and you're overwhelmed because you don't know if you should do cardio or weights, but then there's like the free weights yeah. versus the machines. And like, I, I, I don't know. And so then what you do is you just kind of like hang out and watch TV do at it. night. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. No, it's, it's uh, do things very simple. Yeah. So, um, and we, we were talking about earlier and this might help all of your listeners is 
what we'll, what we'll have is a, a worksheet that will help people. Um, you can go to, do you, do you want it on your site or, or my uh, site? Go ahead and put it on your site. Okay. Yeah. Um, go to let's fix security and that's L E T S F I X security, S E C U R I T Y dot com slash love your work. All, all one word and go to the, go to the site. Um, and you can download a worksheet and, uh, and hopefully it will help everyone and, and open to feedback as well. And that'll take them through the steps of thinking about, you know, their threat model, right? And their potential adversaries, <laughs> their, their, their scenario their, planning. Their plan for being more secure in 2019. Yes. Awesome. Chris Wilkin, thank you so much. I think this is going to be really helpful for a lot of people, including myself. I've got some, some actions I need to take. Awesome. I, I love it. Yes. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can talk about like further things to do later in the future because, because security gets very complicated. Um, you know, even beyond just what we were talking about here. Yeah. I, I mean, if people have feedback or questions for you, that would probably be, be helpful. So where should they contact you? you? You know what? You can, you can contact me at my email and it's Chris at let's fix security.com. And he doesn't use that for any of his other accounts. No. So it is, it is don't even truly, try. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. Do, do not, <laughs> do not hack me. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Is Love Your Work helping you find your unique creative voice? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to become the creator and human you want to be? If so, please be a part of making this a special and nourishing and thoughtful show. Support the show on Patreon. You'll be an even bigger part of this show than you already are. If you contribute just a coffee a month, you'll be helping support the hosting and production of Love Your Work. Everyone has some unique creative gift to offer the world. Together, we can give people the tools they need to bring that work into the world. The world will be better off for it. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash This is a different kind of model for supporting the work you love. The choice is yours. Vote with your dollars, put your money where your mind is, and keep Love Your Work going. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at patreon.com slash cadavy. That's patreon.com slash K A D as in David, A B as in Victor, Y. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsor Roxana Maynard of Agility Alchemist at agilityalchemist.com, and top supporters such as Jeffrey Mason and Vitas Pankovicius. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Tadavi, Inc. <laughs>